Not having the yellow text opening crawl is the new black. Two sins here. One for sending the movie for not doing something you've sent other Star Wars movies for, and another for not realizing that the yellow text opening crawl is for mainline episodes. But still reading. Do you see my point? The inflection when he says, but, insinuates that the first sin was something good, except he sinned that anyway. Do you not see how this is confusing to audiences? I still have people in my parody videos wondering why I sinned something I liked. How omniscient are these opening titles supposed to be? Normally they're essentially biographical, telling us about the status of the rebellion, or the fine details of trade agreements, and their impact on intergalactic legislation. But this is telling us what's in the heart and mind of Han f***ing Solo. I don't think even Han knows what's really in the heart and mind of Han Solo in this movie. My dude. This is not a regular Star Wars movie. It is part of an anthology, so clearly some things will be slightly different. Besides, Han explicitly states that he wants to become a pilot and explore the galaxy multiple times. What are you even talking about? Adding a Star Wars story to the end of this film's title is really infuriating. Like, we need to know that Han Solo is part of the Star Wars universe. I now see why Future Birdman exists. Jeremy, this movie is called A Star Wars Story, because without that, the movie is simply called Solo. If you cannot understand why a movie simply being called Solo might confuse people, well, then I suggest you change your channel's name to Cinema, dropping the sins. Let's see how that works out. Dice. The dice that have been so goddamn important to all the movies up until now. This is a straw man argument. This movie isn't suggesting that these dice had importance in the other movies. It's simply showing that a prop from the older movies has significance in this movie. And the way you've worded this sin sounds to me like you didn't even know Han's dice were in the older movies. Here's Chewbacca hitting his head on the dice in A New Hope. And here they are again in The Last Jedi, which, believe it or not, is older than this movie. Lady Proxima is a prawn, basically. No, she's not a prawn, basically. She's more like a worm or a millipede. I've been telling y'all since the first video in this series, avoid eating at Jeremy's house. Solo, a Tokyo Drift story. Everything wrong with Solo, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so check this out. <laughs> there are vehicles in this movie and there are vehicles in another movie. <laughs> Isn't that outrageous? All over! <laughs> did I hear Wilhelm in there? I'm almost positive I did. That was not a Wilhelm. In fact, to belabor this point, I'm going to use the actual Wilhelm scream as my sin sound for the next two sins. Han palming the dice to the Targaryen here 100% foretells that she's coming back before the movie ends, because I saw The Last Jedi, goddammit. Here's another sin for The Last Jedi, just because I can. Pandering to the mob of people that hate The Last Jedi, are we? I'm not saying it's a bad business move, but this shows precisely how much integrity you have. I've been saying it for a while now, but all you do in your recent videos is check the boxes of what you think will be acceptable on the internet. Which, of course, explains your recent and very fake attempt to show how much of a woke SJW you are. Pandering, people. This is what it looks like. We move out for the southern marshlands. Besides the introduction of Beckett, what does any of this bring to the table? Do we really need several scenes of war footage and strategy speeches? Jeremy answers his own question ex machina. Ah! Fed him in three days. <laughs> Should be fun. So up until now, Chewie was just eating all his cellmates? That is dark, little Ronnie Howard. Dark! No, the insinuation is that the Empire had been starving him and his only recourse would be to eat Han. But why would being dark be a bad thing? Are you forgetting this is the same series that blew up an entire planet to make a point? That Anakin Skywalker actually killed children? That Amelia Clark was actually cast? Also, they make it sound like Chewie's a ravenous badass, and of course, we know he can rip a fool's arms off if he wants. So why all this playing with his food? He hasn't eaten in three days. Han should be all the dead right now. It's absolutely stunning to me how you can ask questions and immediately follow that up with the answer, yet still be confused. He hasn't eaten in three days. That means he's not at full strength. I guess it's kind of funny that Han already speaks Wookiee, but it sure does create an easy escape for both of them that is uber convenient. Thanks for helping me get out of there. Nice sentiment and all, but is this the first chance they've had to have this conversation? They've made it all the way to another planet, and they just shared a shower together. That's a perfect place to chat. Jeremy talks to other people while taking a shower. Yeah, 
He's that guy at the gym. Chewbacca? All right, well, uh, you're gonna need a nickname because I ain't saying that every time. Har har har. This movie could have been great if you'd spent less time paying so much lip service to the films that came before it. A nod here, a hand job there. It gets to be obvious to the viewer and therefore less enjoyable. You might as well have him turn to the camera and tell the audience, you love me? I know! Bro, you know what you signed up for when you paid to watch this movie. It's clearly a prequel meant to set up the characters that we have known and loved for over 40 years. Fan service is basically the name of the game. This is like paying to go see Cats and being upset it's a musical. Besides, there's a hell of a lot of new fans being brought into the fold with the sequel trilogy, so this kind of thing eases them into the Star Wars universe. Our whole future depends on this one school and you bring in amateurs. Gotta side with Val here. Why would Beckett bring in amateurs for their one final score? This is like Danny Ocean bringing the actual Bruce Willis into their heist in Ocean's 12. This is you manipulating a scene yet again. If you just let the next couple of seconds play, Beckett answers why he would bring amateurs to his final job. Our whole future depends on this one school and you bring in amateurs. In case you hadn't noticed, we're a little short-handed. I waited a long time for a shot like this. I'm not about to screw it up. You know, I bet Han's palms are sweaty right now. His knees must also be weak since he's sitting. Those arms definitely look heavy. And what's that on his sweater? Mom's spaghetti? Shut the fuck up. Huh, what do you know? White men can jump. Why does it take three individuals to do the shit on the train? They're essentially just tying some cables down. But no one wants to help Val with the much more dangerous part of the mission? I'm just saying, if they didn't have Chewie and Han, this would have probably gone much smoother. What? In case you don't remember what you just sent the movie for, Rio gets killed in this scene, which meant that Han had to take over as pilot. Then one of the cars of the train had to be released for the ship to even be able to tow it, something that required the strength of Chewbacca. If Han nor Chewie were present, Rio and Val would have still been killed, meaning Beckett probably would have died on his own as he couldn't pilot the ship and release the car by himself. Coaxium! Enough to power a fleet! F***ing fuel! Someone is still triggered by fuel. Get down to the couplers! What the hell? There was no part of the plan that Beckett laid out earlier that involved getting shot at by armed guards. What the hell do you think they brought weapons for, CinemaSins? Come on, you can't be this stupid. You sure about that, BB? Because I don't think you're sure about that. Chewie! F*** off. I looked it up. Chewie's 7'3", and almost 112 kilograms, which is Canadian for 250 pounds. Ain't no way Han is pulling him back on the train with one f***ing hand. No, no, no. I don't accept this sin. You said you looked this up. Where did you look this up? Was it perhaps online? Where did that source get its information? Because I'm pretty sure it's a book. And as you always say, the books don't matter. Except when they do to fit whatever narrative you're trying to spin, of course. On his first heist, Han is given an opportunity to prove his piloting skills. What are the f***ing odds? Never tell me the odds. She just killed herself so the score could carry on. For money. For her husband and his crew. She didn't think her life was worth more than a score. Like, everyone in the crew would rather have her live and they go on for another score down the road. But not her. It's not like her death is for the greater good or anything. This is an attempt to steal for profit! I'm sorry, this death has no emotional weight for me because it makes no logical sense. You have failed at watching Solo A Star Wars Story. In the very next scene, Beckett explains that acquiring that cargo was not for profit, but for their lives, as Dryden Voss of the Crimson Dawn hired them for this job, which would result in their deaths if they failed. In this scene, Val realizes she is surrounded by Viper droids and that if the mission doesn't succeed, Beckett will die regardless, so she sacrifices herself for the person she loves. You see, if you actually paid attention to films that you do videos on, this would be self-evident, but considering the way you need your handheld when you watch movies... This movie suffers from a common cinema affliction these days. Last second-itis. Wait, what was that? From a common cinema affliction these days. One more time. Cinema affliction, cinema affliction, cinema affliction, cinema, 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 cinema. <laughs> This movie suffers from a common cinema affliction these days. Last seconditis. As though every bomb exploding, train derailing, airplane crashing, jabroni beating, pie eating, trail blazing, eyebrow raising, entertaining the globe, never hotter, talking to two rejects from Harry Potter. We were hired by Crimson Dawn. Isn't that the group that Hans Gruber read about in Time Magazine? Oh hey, here's CinemaSins ignoring the scene that explains why Val would sacrifice herself. Never change, CinemaSins. Never change. For me, it's worth the risk. How about you? 
This is the quickest I've seen a civilian fully commit to a life of crime since the Amazing Yen in Ocean's Eleven. Are you referring to the already criminal Han Solo or the fugitive Chewbacca who's trying to save his people? In this movie's version of a rich crime lord's space yacht penthouse, we have a singer with a Bane pacifier and half a Shazam-themed Lazy Susan on her head, beside one of the more disgusting Ripley clone fails from Alien Resurrection, plus thousands of sequins. And in the previous scene, you had a two-meter-tall hairy alien that speaks in a series of guttural yells. What, that's not strange because you've seen it before? Paul Bettany, now having appeared in Star Wars and Marvel movies, is hereby literally 30% owned by Disney. Everything wrong with Solo. An actor is in other movies made by the production company. What are you doing here? I, I work here. As I've said before, space is really, really big. So what are the odds Han and Kira find each other on this f***ing yacht? Please, someone with an advanced mathematics degree, show me what the actual f***ing odds are of this happening. You don't need to see the odds of this happening because the movie flat out tells you that it's going to happen. Wherever we go, it can't be worse than where we've been. Yes, it can. Out there, we've got no protection. We could get snatched up by traffickers, sold to Crimson Dawn or the Hut Cartel. Charisma, not to mention his... Prodigious. I get it. Is that a cock joke thrown in the middle of a Star Wars movie? Because I think that was a cock joke thrown in the middle of a Star Wars movie. Jeremy points out other people saying boner. Is the seat taken? Nobody's in the seat getting any taken, friend. Wow, this might apply for a poker game. Or at least this poker game. But as a general life rule, this is some terrible f***ing advice. Try this empty seats are claimable bullshit with the director's chair on a movie set. Or at the Masters. Or in Buckingham f***ing Palace. Well, I guess I'm here to break down parts of a sentence to a person that has written actual books. Anyway, Lando was responding to Han saying, Is this seat taken? Emphasis on the word this. This is a determiner used to identify a specific thing close at hand or being indicated or experienced. In other words, when Lando responds, Nobody's in the seat, can I take in front? The seat is in reference to Han's this seat. In other other words, the movie is not talking about the bullshit that you are. Anything, Han? That's Han, but... That's okay. This attempt to retcon Billy D. Williams' odd pronunciation of the name in the original trilogy makes me super angry. Not everything we wondered about needs a f***ing explanation! God, it's like modern movies want to stamp out human imagination rather than inspiring it. Imagine saying this unironically. I mean, the guy that literally sits here and shits on movies for a living, claiming something else wants to stamp out imagination. Like, the balls you must have to say this, as if this isn't what you do every single time you open your mouth. The sad part is, this isn't even an explanation. Han told him his name and he mispronounces it. It's never explained why he does this. And I'm calling with what? My ship. Against your ship. Yeah, but that's not how calling works. Han put his chips into the pot, which was on top of the $2,000 bet. So if Lando calls with his ship, it's to cover the chips that are on the table. Hold on, in the previous sin, you just complained about the Sabacc scene because way too much footage of this alien poker game that ultimately means nothing since no one knows how it's played. Now you're all of a sudden an expert on whether or not Lando can call with his ship? New move. We're making the Kessel Run. This movie makes the Kessel Run sound famous, but then immediately points out how impossible it is, which means only a few could have even tried it, making me wonder how it ever got famous. Other than the mention in the original trilogy, of course. It is famous because it's the name of a route. What they are suggesting is that the route is perilous and mainly used by spice smugglers, not that it is impossible. The difficulty lies in the fact that they will be smuggling raw coaxium, which is unstable and wouldn't make the trip normally, hence the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. I'm gonna need half the take. You don't even know how much the take is, though. Why speak in fractions before you even know the total haul in dollars or credits or whatevers? Because whatever their take is, which is sure to be considerable considering Crimson Dawn is involved, 50% of that will obviously be worth his while. I mean, are you serious right now? And what if I don't elect to go to Kessel? Please don't start. <laughs> this laugh. I actually would have a memory wiped. But she's got the best damn navigational database in the galaxy. It seems like the Star Wars movies are littered with people that are the best damn something in the galaxy. Pretty sure almost every movie ever made is about exceptional people, but go off, sis. Also, how did Enfys know they were going out to get more coaxium? It's not like she was in the meeting with Voss. And even if she saw Han and Lando together, there's no way she'd know for sure what they were up to. Towards the end of the film, Enfys Nest explains that Crimson Dawn had been stealing coaxium from her home planet for generations. This means that whenever Crimson Dawn was involved, she knew it had something to do with coaxium. While you guys tear up or get horny watching him passionately kiss some not-Princess Leia woman, I'd like to point out a more important issue. 
which is that these rods have nothing to keep these hangers from sliding off. Someone really skip. You need anything. Equal rights? L3's quest for droid citizenship is played for laughs here, but we won't be laughing when the robots start asking for rights here in the real world. We'll be screaming. Screaming at the latest horror film directed by a robot as we scarf down popcorn made by a robot in a home theater made by robots while a robot version of my college girlfriend skip. skip. Of course, the alien vault guard has an external set of sensitive sex organs in the exact same place as a human. Jesus, there are more crotchal references in this movie than I remembered. One thing you'll notice about Pike Sentinels, besides the fact that they're rocking Timberlands, is that they also have four fingers and an opposable thumb, a distinctly mammalian anthropoid feature. They're also bipedal and apparently have binocular vision. My point is that whatever evolutionary path their species took, having balls ain't the only thing they have in common with Star Wars humans, which aren't even humans in the first place, but that's a topic for another video. L3! I know he's sad and we're supposed to be sad, but I can't help but think, dude, you f***ed a robot. That's whack. Jeremy makes up nonsense that fools his very gullible audience. Damn, that shit's whack. You can't make the Kessel Run in less than 20 parsecs. F***ing parsecs. Are they distance? Are they time? You don't know. The entire Star Wars canon doesn't know. This whole trial is out of order. Attica! Attica! We're going to ignore that pop culture reference and point out that parsecs are real and they are a measurement of distance in astronomy. We need to divert auxiliary power to the rear deflector shield. Because we're now showing a run Han famously bragged about making in record time distance, we're robbed here as viewers of the chance to feel any tension for like more than 10 f***ing minutes. The characters feel tension, but they're paid actors. I know he makes it and does so in record fashion, so all these speed bumps along the way are just red herring. So, this video is essentially Jeremy ranting about a prequel for 19 minutes because he knows what's going to happen. I remind you, this is a prequel, and he's mad because he knows what's going to happen. Now! Now! This doesn't work? What the hell? I had a raging sin boner, and now the movie subverted it by sacrifice. Oh, that's the stuff. This works. Jeremy says boner. Again. Just did the castle run in 12 parsecs. Great, kid. Don't get cocky. Again, another non-sin because there was a scene CinemaSins wanted to include in a video. Do you get why I keep saying they're padding the sin count, or do y'all need more crunching in your ears? Not this time. I'm leaving. Hang on. Is he pretending to run? Like, without the profits or the coaxium? How the f*** would Han actually believe this? What actually happened here is Beckett realizes he's outgunned versus Infus Nest and decided to double-cross Han under the facade of allowing Infus to keep the coaxium. I know, this is a movie made for 12-year-olds, so it's a bit difficult to follow. Oh, I'm talking about my other associate. Can you come in and join us, please? Dum, dum, dum! I mean, who the f*** else was it gonna be? Considering this is one of the most convoluted endings I've ever seen in a Star Wars film, no, I'm not buying that you, of all people, knew it was Beckett. Go, I'm right behind you. Even if Han weren't clouded by his boner, shouldn't he get a few more details? The third time Jeremy has said boner. Kira, you and I will be working much more closely from now on. I don't know about that, dude. Did you see the box office numbers for this thing? Jeremy has never heard of Disney+. Plus. Hello there. From what I understand, this is the story of the people who try to steal the Death Star plans, which drives the plot of A New Hope. I wonder if they'll succeed. I haven't felt this much suspense since Titanic. So, apparently, it's a sin for prequels to exist simply because you know the outcome already. By definition, this also means any film that has a sequel now retroactively becomes a sin because by watching the sequel, you know the outcome of the original film already. You see why this is silly? It's not a Star Wars breakfast without some mysterious blue liquid. It's not a CinemaSins video without randomly pointing things out on the screen. In-movie Stormtrooper toys are much larger and cooler than any of the sh I got to play with back in the 80s. Everything wrong with Rogue One, ladies and gentlemen. The toys in the movie are cool. Planet Killer! That's what he called it! This is essentially the fourth of eight movies in the Star Wars franchise that focuses on either the Death Star or something like the Death Star. Get your head out of your Death Star, Star Wars. I fail to understand why this is a sin, though. 
This film directly leads into A New Hope, so this film has to focus on the Death Star. Return of the Jedi used the Death Star too because the first Death Star was the greatest weapon the galaxy had ever seen and they'd wanted to improve upon it, removing the Urso flaw. Come on, movie. I know we have a lot of characters to meet and little time to do so, but how am I supposed to keep up with Ring of Kafren, Jedha, Wobani, and this place? God damn, this movie changes planets faster than a Guardians of the Galaxy film. Well, this franchise is called Star Wars. It's set in a galaxy, and as galaxies have billions of stars with billions of planets, you should expect to see multiple planets in locations. They only showed you four at this point, so it's not like that's even a hard number to keep up with. Also, Jeremy makes a pop culture reference that isn't a sin of the film cliche. What is this? It's a chance for you to make a fresh start. We like using prisoners for make or break missions. In fact, we're also waiting on Sean Connery to finish getting a haircut while we skip. This is Captain Cassian Andor, Rebel Intelligence. AKA Discount Han Solo. Actually, this is Discount Han Solo. Also, I'm happy Mon Mothma is in this, and they got the same actress from Revenge of the Sith to play her, but where the f*** was she in A New Hope? This is kind of confusing, since she was the main rebel leader in Return of the Jedi. Mothma was evacuated as a result of the events of this film. This film takes place directly before A New Hope, so during that film, she was being protected and hidden in the three to four years between this film and Return of the Jedi. You find him, you kill him. Boss Dude tells Cassian to kill Galen if they find him, the guy that designed the supposed planet-killing weapon. You don't want to ask that guy a few questions, maybe? Interrogate him? You're answering yourself. Galen designed a planet-killing weapon. Someone with that level of ingenuity could be forced to continue creating weapons of mass destruction. Not to mention Galen willingly created weapons for the Empire, and Draven wants to kill him on principle as he's responsible for countless deaths. Ah, frightening CGI decisions. Pretending CGI Tarkin isn't impressive. Weird but impressive. This fucking mind-reading Jabba ripoff with a dozen tentacle penises. Jeremy says boner. Poor gullet can feel your thoughts. That's pretty insanely useful, but I'm wondering, how did Saw end up hiring Boar Gullet? Or did he just come with the cake? Random questions that pop into your mind are not sins. Boar Gullet is a Marin, and all Marins can read thoughts. They are kept by different organizations for this express purpose, and it's not at all unbelievable that Saw could have acquired one. Fried this. Pointing things out on the screen, cliche. You just got yourself. Callback to a new hope is callback. Jeremy hates fan service. What do you know about Kyber Crystals? My father, he, he said they powered the Jedi's lightsabers. Is it just me, or are the Kyber Crystals this movie's midichlorians? In other words, things that rob you of the mystery of Star Wars. Not at all. Kyber crystals have been a thing since 2012, where it was revealed that they were what gave lightsabers their color in the Clone Wars. In Knights of the Old Republic, a semi-canon game that came out in 2003, it was revealed that certain other crystals were used in the construction of lightsabers, giving them a variety of colors as well. The strongest stars have hearts of Kyber. This line not only makes little sense, it's never returned to or paid off in any way. Considering the Death Star literally uses Kyber to power its super laser, yeah, this isn't returned to or paid off in any way. Who are they? The Guardians of the Wills. Unless you have subtitles, the names of these things in movies are totally confusing. I heard this as Guardians of the Wills in a movie theater. But apparently it's Guardians of the Wills, and now I've got to figure out what the f*** a will is. Oh, it's the Force? Well, sh**. First of all, a will is a being that follows a religion similar to the Jedi, not the Force. It was a will that taught Qui-Gon how to become a Force ghost. And second, I'm pretty sure you didn't know how to spell Bor Gullet or Jin Erso when you heard them, so if those aren't sins, neither is this. This scene does a good job not letting you know where anyone really is, and an even better job making you not care. I'm becoming more and more convinced that if it isn't just two guys slapping each other with their dicks while being filmed with a camera phone, Jeremy hates action. Did you know that wasn't me? This is almost remove a sin worthy, but this is a disobedient f***ing droid right here. And how the f*** did K2SO know where Jin and Cassian were? Oh, I don't know, Jeremy. Maybe he followed the big-ass explosions and blaster noises. Just a thought. Go back to the ship. Wait for my call. Oh, now he obeys, after Axe Machina disobeying and saving their lives. I find your misuse of Deus Ex Machina disturbing. Hollow porn. Sinning hollow porn. Glad this movie gave him the oxygen problem to pad the runtime from 2 hours 14 minutes to 2 hours 15 minutes. I mean, phew, right? Says the guy that has padded this video to 17 minutes with frivolous shit like this. We call it the Death Star. There is no better name, and the day is coming soon when it will be unleashed. Well, it'll be unleashed in mere minutes on this very city, so pre-recorded Galen is pressing his f here. On accident. What are you even saying here? That it's convenient that they watched a video that bears relevance to their situation? Dude, 
This is a movie. Literally everything that happens is convenient when you think about it. I've placed a weakness deep within the system. Movie tries to retroactively excuse the Death Star's ludicrous weak spot, but fails because that weak spot is still so stupidly obvious someone in the Empire should have noticed that long before Luke trusted the Force. You mean the weak spot that took a one in a million shot from one of the most powerful Force users of all time to exploit? Also, Galen Erso created the small shaft that Luke will one day fire his one in a million, one in a million shot into, winning the day for the Rebels. But if he had this kind of power in creating the Death Star, surely he could have figured out a way that would not have required such long odds. Wait a minute, you just suggested that he made it obvious, insinuating that it's something easily exploited, but now you're saying that it's nearly impossible to reach in the first place. You can't eat your cake and have it too. <laughs> There's literally no reason for the Death Star to cause a total eclipse on Jeddah before annihilating Jeddah City. Cool shot that in no way makes sense. Who the fuck taught you astronomy? I'd like a word. How does this in no way make sense? A total eclipse can be caused by any celestial object large enough to block out the light of a star. You'll need the plans. The structural plans for the Death Star to find the reactor. Why didn't Galen go ahead and send the Death Star plans to Saw? Yeah, yeah, the plans are on some other planet. But why not at least send a drawing or some If he could get this message to Saw, surely he could get the plans or a drawing to him. You misunderstand. Galen didn't design the exhaust port on the Death Star, only the instability of the core, which the exhaust port leads to. You're asking for schematics that Galen simply doesn't have, which is why they need to get to those plans in the first place. Not only that, if Urso did know the schematics by heart and gave some sort of drawing in a message, Think about what would happen if that message fell into the hands of the Empire. They'd have removed the weakness of the Death Star and it would have never gotten destroyed. Ah, Star Wars, the universe where merely shooting a lock makes it unlock. That's nowhere near just the Star Wars thing. Besides, the logic could just be that the electronics in the locking mechanism is holding the lock in place, so if they fail, the lock releases. Somehow this is possible, while this is also going on and nobody important dies in this scene. What? Saw dies in this scene. What the hell are you talking about? Think about the serendipity here. The Rebels find Jin in a prison on some distant planet, take her to the Rebel headquarters, and send Cassian with her to go find Saw. Then the Empire tests the Death Star on the very planet where Saw is. He shows her the Galen Erso recording, and luckily Cassian was able to totally bullshit his way out of his cell to save Jin just in time to fly off the planet before they die. This is all because you're not paying attention to what you're watching. From the top, the Empire is here because of Jeddah's large kyber crystal deposits, which leads Saw here to figure out what the Empire is up to. This leads the Rebels to attempt to track down Saw and figure out what he knows, which obviously leads them to this planet. Because of the large kyber deposits, the Empire wanted to destroy Jeddah entirely, but Tarkin decided to just destroy the capital city, leading to them testing the super laser there. Serendipity my ass. Suicide by stubbornly refusing to leave with the others. I feel nothing. He had his chances. Didn't you just say nobody important dies in this scene? And fire! Stop the critic! How are there not at least six people dead after Critic just yelled fire? Because no one fired immediately after he yelled fire? That was easy. Also, didn't Bodhi tell Cassian a few moments ago that getting through these canyons was tough because the Empire had sensors and shit all through it? Why were they able to fly through here without any alarms going off? Why do you just fing lie? Here's the full scene. Get the squadron leader on. Get him on now. They're already engaged, so. Without any alarms going off? Could the Empire get any more Sauron? A pop culture reference Jeremy has made, hmm? Yep, this movie's gonna use the all red helmeted Imperial Guard dudes, even though A New Hope and Empire both had none of them. It's telling that you had to cherry pick and say that episodes 4 and 5 didn't show the Royal Guards, especially because they were in Return of the Jedi. In A New Hope and Empire, Vader never needed the Royal Guard, as he was always accompanied by a troop of stormtroopers, and in Empire we never saw the Emperor outside of a hologram, so you wouldn't see his guards. The only reason they are included here is because Vader is relatively vulnerable while in his Bakta tank, and because of the sensitive nature of the transmissions between Vader and the Emperor, only the Red Guards are trusted with the information that Palpatine is Lord Sidious. Its power to create problems has certainly been confirmed. Damn, Darth Vader's beginning to sound as bad as Bugs Bunny without Mel Blanc. Which is weird, since this is before A New Hope. It's almost like the actor doing his voice is 40 years older now. So weird. What? James Earl Jones sounds just as amazing here as he did in 1977. Here's a comparison. Several transmissions were beamed to the ship by rebel spies. I want to know what happened to the plans they sent you. Power to create problems has certainly been confirmed. So I'm still in command? Careful not to choke on your aspirations, Director. This is a little known fact, but Darth Vader spent some time as James Bond from 1960 to 1962. 
This confirms my long-held suspicion that Jeremy tells horribly thought-out jokes just to include the coolest scenes from movies that he can't think of any legitimate way to send. You're asking us to invade an Imperial installation based on nothing but hope. Nice line, but no, she's got information about the installation's weakness, as well as legit experience versus Imperial troops, and a blind force ninja for a friend. Except, no, she is referencing the fact that Jin said this. Send the Rebel fleet if you have to. You need to capture the Death Star plans if there's any hope of destroying it. Which is stating that the information about the installation's weakness is hope. They're expressing doubt that the information is credible or if it will even help. Your friend, the Jedi. Yes, I will send for him. You will need someone you can trust. I would trust her with my life. I thought Princess Leia was on her way to Alderaan at the beginning of A New Hope, and Vader boarded their ship around the time they reached Tatooine. So sending the plans with R2-D2 to give to Obi-Wan was a Hail Mary. But here, apparently, she was sent to see Obi-Wan before the Rebellion even knew Rogue One went on their unsanctioned mission. This is just blatant misunderstanding of what is actually going on. Darth Vader told you the truth in A New Hope. The Imperial Senate will not distill for this. When they hear you've attacked a diplomatic... Don't act so surprised, Your Highness. You weren't on any mercy mission this time. I want to know what happened to the plans they sent you. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take it away! This shows that Vader was already aware of the Death Star plans being given to her and that she was working for the Rebel Alliance. The fact that she was intercepted above Tatooine proves that she was here to give a message to Obi-Wan. I've got a bad feeling about okay. Quiet. Oh, f you, movie. Okay, so when you pull one of your running gags, can I say, oh, f you, Jeremy? Because I think that's what you're saying. Scatter. They're going to scatter. BB-8 and K-2SO have replaced both of you in our hearts. You aren't the droids we're looking for. Move along. <laughs> what did you say, nigga? Why is she wearing Deadpool-style double swords on her back? Have we seen her use that kind of thing at all in this movie? Yeah, yeah, she snuck in here in some bounty hunter droid costume thing, but still. No, no, stop right there. This is you answering your own question again. But it gets worse, so please continue. Wearing Deadpool-style double swords on her back. Have we seen her use that kind of thing at all in this movie? Yeah, yeah, she snuck in here in some bounty hunter droid costume thing, but still. You had your heroine wearing this for the climax and never once let her use them? That's a sin for the costume designer, I think. These aren't double swords, genius. They're aircraft marshalling wands. If you were paying attention, you'd have seen this guy using them earlier. The master switch! It's out there, that console! I'm going! <laughs> Usually I'd go, this f***ing laugh, and give you 10 sins, but this particular laugh was extra fake, so double the sins. Just look at the size of that hard drive whatever it is thing. And sure, the Death Star plans are probably a huge file, but Jesus, Leia puts them inside R2-D2 later, so why'd the Empire need this much storage? I mean, it's not like this is the raw data for the schematics of a structure the size of a moon or anything. What the unholy f*** is this bullsh**? A vent? Die with the Rebellion. Dead guy, ex machina. Is this scene with Darth Vader badass and awesome? Yes. Does it contradict basically every physical movement Vader made in the original trilogy? Yes. How? Vader calmly stalks and walks down his victims, just like he always does. This is exactly how he's always been portrayed. Hope. Ah, f you, movie. Hope, 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 hope. Say, do you remember the first movie was called A New Hope? Hope, hope. Bob, hope. Hope Solo.